many people are told by their doctors to restrict salt. And restricting salt really doesn't work for you if you're doing keto. Hello everybody, this is Felix, your friendly neighborhood kidney hacker, reporting back to you for episode number six. This time on the much talked about topic of sodium restriction and blood pressure in PKD. So, where do we begin? Do you even know what sodium does to your blood pressure exactly? Well, sodium, if you look at it from a really high level, constricts your blood vessels, while another mineral called potassium relaxes your blood vessels. What you should immediately notice here is that potassium is a very important part of this balance. Potassium regulates how much sodium your kidney actually holds on to. So it's really a much more delicate balance that we're talking about here. And it's much more about the ratio of sodium to potassium instead of just sodium itself that we need to address. So when we restrict sodium, we change the ratio of sodium to potassium, right? What if there was another way to change this ratio? Could it be maybe to increase potassium? In general, of course, it's a great idea to have your blood pressure under control. And there are many factors in PKD beyond just the sodium potassium balance that can influence your blood pressure. But today we're just looking at this electrolyte component of the whole picture. Because many people are told by their doctors to restrict salt. And restricting salt really doesn't work for you if you're doing keto. But we get to that in a moment. So the quote unquote salt sensitivity that people talk about is really in many cases just a deficiency in potassium. So instead of restricting salt, you could try refilling your potassium stores by increasing your potassium intake and see where that gets you. So there even was a study in 2015 to sort of address this sodium potassium balance in relation to blood pressure. And what they tested is a high sodium potassium ratio diet versus a low sodium potassium ratio diet in rats and in humans. What they did is they put each group on this specific diet for four days and then they switched it around. At the end of each period, they measured blood pressure or in the case of humans, they didn't measure blood pressure, but they used a proxy, which is the phosphorylated sodium chloride transporter. This just means they're using a blood test as a proxy for an actual blood pressure measurement because it can vary so much in short-term studies. So using this phosphorylated sodium chloride transporter is a more consistent way of assessing where people's blood pressure is probably going to be. And this transporter really just tells us how much sodium does the body transport and how much does it hold on to. And what they found is really that increasing potassium is the main driver in reducing blood pressure. Having this increased potassium intake in mice led to an over 20% decrease in systolic blood pressure. And in humans, we saw a similar trend, but in this case characterized by the transporter that they measured, showing that also in humans, we get the same effect that we saw in the mice. The takeaway of the researchers really was that Increasing potassium is the main factor in trying to lower blood pressure if you're talking about electrolyte balance and the sodium potassium ratio that influences the blood pressure directly. What doctors tend to call salt sensitivity in many cases really is just potassium deficiency. When have you last checked your potassium intake? Maybe you didn't. So maybe it's a good time to start doing that. Because most people actually eat way too little potassium. In the standard American diet, people eat over 3 grams of sodium per day and just about 1 gram of potassium per day. But really, the requirement is the other way around. So we need about a gram of sodium per day and about 4 grams of potassium per day if we're on a standard American diet. Of course, there's a lot of processed foods in there which makes it even more difficult to get a proper sodium intake and also to get a proper potassium intake because there's no potassium in the processed foods. Of course, the big caveat here is you should know your blood potassium levels. If your levels are already increased because of low kidney function, then you should be talking to your doctor about how much potassium you can actually intake. And there are actually potassium blockers on the market if your levels go too high. Because this is all about blood levels. And if your blood levels are already high, then of course, you don't need to increase them further by increasing your potassium intake. 
Now, this requirement of the ratio of sodium to potassium changes a lot if you do a ketogenic diet. So someone on the standard American diet would need about one to four sodium to potassium ratio in their dietary intake every day. Someone on a ketogenic type diet might need more of a one to one ratio. And of course, this doesn't reduce our requirement for potassium, but it increases our requirement for sodium. Why is that? When you go on a ketogenic diet, insulin actually drops much lower than it would be on a standard American diet which leads your kidneys to lose and excrete more sodium and water. And that, of course, reduces your sodium blood levels. So you're losing the sodium all day because you don't have that much insulin, which, of course, is what we want, right? We want the blood sugar to be much lower because of the ketogenic diet, and that leads to much lower insulin levels, which is what we want. But at the same time, it is what causes sodium to be lost in the urine. Kidney doesn't reabsorb so much. And that is why we need to increase our intake by a lot. Now, if you fail to do this, that is when you might see the quote unquote keto flu symptoms that have become so famous in the keto circles over time. What are those symptoms? Well, they include headache, fatigue, weakness. Of course, part of this also is that your body is trying to adapt to be able to use ketones as an energy source. But a large part of it actually can be this sodium deficiency when people aren't salting their food enough. So how do you salt your food enough? How do you make sure that your intake is right for you? The best thing to do is actually to salt your food to taste. If you make a dish and you start eating it, then you should have a salty taste. Some people have gotten used to not miss the salty taste that they should be having in their food, but you should be tasting salty when you prepared your food. If you don't taste salty, then you probably didn't salt it enough. Of course, if you salt it too much, it's going to be uncomfortable, right? There have actually been studies to confirm what everybody should have learned from their grandma, which is your taste can tell you if you've eaten enough salt. There's actually many studies that have shown that when you have eaten enough salt, that that changes how you perceive the taste of foods. So salt becomes more salty if you have adequate sodium in your body. Fascinating how that works, right? There's even other minerals that works with, for example, zinc. There's a test called the Bryce Smith and Simpson zinc taste test. And what they do is they have a standardized solution of zinc sulfate powder that they um, put in water. And if you can taste bitter from this solution, then you probably have adequate zinc status. If this solution tastes neutral to you, so your sensitivity to zinc in the water is low, then that means that your zinc status is probably not great. And there even was a recent study testing this um, method in women, for some reason, it didn't look as if it was accurate, but in males, actually, they found that it correlated pretty well. So males were able to tell their zinc status by taste testing this zinc sulfate solution. Pretty interesting, right? So what we learned from this is really, we can salt our food to taste and our body will tell us if we need more. There is even a salt gluttony if you will, uh, if you're low in salt. So you can really trust your taste buds on this, especially on a ketogenic diet when you need much more. One to three teaspoons of salt per day is usually where people end up at. I personally don't measure because I just trust my taste buds. But if you want to measure, then this is probably where you're going to end up. Now, of course, the diet that I recommend, which is the Bulletproof diet, is naturally pretty low in sodium because we don't use any processed foods. So where would the sodium really come from, right? So the sodium is the sodium that we add. That, of course, is a stark contrast to processed foods in the standard American diet, which contain a lot more salt than your taste buds can actually tell because it's masked by so many of the flavors and sugars that are added to the same foods. In the Bulletproof diet or any kind of whole food ketogenic type diet, you can tell if there's enough salt in your food or not and if it's too much because you've added it and it's very, very transparent to your taste buds. So you can really know what you're eating. 
it's very important you find a high quality salt. There are a lot of low quality salts out there. There's even stories of glass shards in the standard kind of refined salts that are sold in stores. And also sea salt can be an issue because of microplastics and other contaminants that have made it into our oceans very sadly. So my recommendation is to get a high quality rock salt or an ancient sea salt. My favorite brand is Real Salt from Redmond. They get it from ancient ocean deposits that have been dried out for millions of years. So it's clean and it has the same composition as the oceans, just minus all the contaminants. Now about potassium, the good news is that all the whole foods on the Bulletproof or keto type diet will be pretty high in potassium. So if you make a dish that is as we recommend, part beef and part non-starchy vegetables, you will get a lot of your potassium met that way. For example, a pound of beef will have about a gram of potassium, an avocado will have more than 500 milligrams of potassium. And if you make a big salad, that would also go a long way to fill up your potassium stores. Same goes for cauliflower, broccoli is pretty high. To make sure that you're actually hitting the target, it makes sense to put all of your food, at least for a while, into a food tracker app such as Chronometer, which is a really good companion app to uh, make sure that your diet is actually doing what you want it to do. And then you will see where your dietary intake puts you. The US RDA is 4,700 milligrams of potassium per day. This is pretty high and can be hard to get with just natural foods, but even a goal of 3,500 milligrams has been shown to be beneficial. So if you can't quite reach the 4,700 milligrams, don't despair, but at least the 3,500 milligrams should be your goal. If you can't quite get there with vegetables and beef or lamb, then of course you have the option of supplementing a little bit of potassium. Maybe a gram per day should be enough because the rest really should be coming from foods. So if you're supplementing with, for example, potassium citrate, you'll also be doing something good for your body pH and you'll also be doing something good for your potassium stores. So to recap, if somebody is telling you to restrict salt, they really need to go back to the drawing board because it's not about the salt, it's about the potassium. And it's about the salt to potassium ratio, which in a ketogenic diet is a lot lower optimally than it would be in a standard American diet. So in keto, we really want it to be about one to one. You wanna consume as much sodium as you are potassium and you make sure that you get the sodium by salting to taste, and you also track using chronometer, and you also track your potassium intake. You use whole foods like beef, like non-starchy vegetables to fill up your potassium stores, and if necessary, you can also add some potassium citrate to supplement your potassium intake if it's not quite enough, but you really you shouldn't be relying on potassium citrate as your main source of potassium, because really we wanna be eating whole foods, which have so many other benefits really nourishing the body. Really get as much as you can from whole foods. Finding a high quality salt brand is essential. I recommend an ancient sea salt as the most clean option out there because it mirrors what is in our oceans, but it doesn't have all the contaminants. Your body will tell you how much salt you really need and you should make sure that you balance it out with enough potassium from vegetables and beef in your diet and maybe a little bit of a potassium supplement if necessary. So if this episode has helped you out, guys, I would appreciate it if you left me a thumbs up or a heart or whatever's available on your platform. And if you're on a podcast platform, then please leave us a five-star review because it helps other people find this podcast. And you know, this is a very small niche. So uh, PKD people really need the help of finding this content. Until the next time, happy healing.